raised a uh, great many questions. You may have some questions about some of the things he said. You may have some questions about other things that he hasn't had an opportunity to mention in this few minutes that he's spoken. I invite you now to ask your questions. Miguel will be very happy to answer them. Who's going to be first? Come My question is, what's the policy of CPC about the housing problem? <coughs> housing is the most important <coughs> subject for the immigrants. Whosoever comes in the Canada, he wants he should have two different house. Well, houses are so much costly, and going on going on spiraling prices of the houses. What's the policy? I I hope that there should be. Government should come in this sector, parallel to the private sector. The government should provide the cheap houses to the public. There should be competition in the society mm -hmm. between private and government sector in the housing. Then the prices of the housing, rising prices can be checked. What's the policy of the CPC in this regard? Okay. Second thing, there is some pamphlets I have read. Marxist Leninist part, Party of Canada, mm -hmm. MLPC, is also in the election free. They are claiming that they have nominated 80 candidates in all over Canada. Mm -hmm. so what's that party? Mm -hmm. And what are the relations between these two parties, CPC and uh, MLPC? I want to know this. Okay. Yeah. Okay, uh, perhaps early. Perhaps you'll, you'll have an opportunity for your third question and others after uh, he answers these two, and other people have an opportunity also. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you thank very you, much. Thank you. The second round, right? Okay, thank you. Um, well, any further questions, or you want me to respond okay. to these? I respond to them as we get them. Okay, yes. fine. Okay, so for, thank you very much. They're, they're both really important questions. Um, with respect to housing, uh, I didn't refer to it in my comments, but those of you who have looked at our platform will know that we have a whole section on housing. We think that, uh, um, as you say, it's one of the uh, most uh, important necessities of life, food, clothing, and housing. And it is also um, the most expensive. People are spending most of their incomes on housing. Recent studies have shown that uh, that uh, you know, upwards of 30% or more of, of, of uh, people in the GTA are spending uh, you know, almost 50% of their net income on housing. And it's because there, of course, there is this bubble, grossly inflated prices for housing. And the argument is, well, you know, we, we, can, we can have high prices because the interest rates are so low. But what happens if the interest rates go up even 1% or 2%? People are not going to be able to meet their, their mortgage payments, and they're going to lose their homes, just like what happened in the United States in 2008, where there were literally millions of people thrown out of their homes, homes that they had for 20 years, 15, 20 years, and they were, they were rendered homeless. And the private sector, as you correctly pointed out, is not interested in building affordable housing because they don't make as much profit on that. They're not interested in, even in producing rental facilities. Everything's a condo and, you know, and so on and so forth. That's why our party calls for a crash program to build publicly, to, for public financing to construct <coughs> one million affordable uh, uh, public and social housing units in Canada. That's a big number. But there is the need for that. Not only are there homeless people, but there are people living in o overcrowded conditions or they're paying far too much. You're quite right that if these units were built, and by the way, there was a time, not on that scale, but nevertheless there was a time when the federal government was involved in uh, housing construction through the Central Mortgage and Housing Corporation. And now they virtually don't build any new housing. 
But there was a time when, when they would uh, support cooperative housing and other types of, of social housing. But if those one million <laughs> units were constructed, not only would it help to bring down the prices everywhere, because then the, the, the private landlords would be forced to bring down the, their prices or people just wouldn't live there, but it would also stimulate the economy as a whole not just for construction jobs, not just for plumbers and electricians and carpenters and so on, but every one of those units would need a refrigerator and would need a stove and would need maybe a, a dishwasher or, or, you know, or, or some other appliances and help to stimulate the small appliance industries, which have also been decimated in Canada thanks to free trade and so on. In southern Ontario, there used to be factories that made small appliances all over the, uh, you know, uh, um, the Niagara Peninsula and, and other parts of southern Ontario. And a lot of those jobs and industries have um, disappeared. They've either been exported or they've been shut down. But that would stimulate secondary manufacturing, which in our view is key. You know, the, the Tories and big business and monopoly, they just want to use Canada to be drawers of water and hewers of wood. They're not interested in developing secondary manufacturing. But for every job in primary industry, whether it's a mine or whether it's at a wellhead, for every job, if that resource was then developed in uh, secondary manufacturing, it creates 10 more jobs. So one job here creates 10 jobs there. But you need a, a policy and a government that stands for rebuilding our decimated uh, secondary industry. I know I'm getting a little bit off the point here, but, but I think, I think uh, the, the question of housing is a key, a key question. It's vital to most Canadians, and especially in markets like Toronto, like Vancouver, where I was you know, last week, where they have ridiculously high prices as well, and people are desperate for affordable housing. But not just in Vancouver and Toronto. In, in, in uh, pl places in Alberta, this is a big issue as well. In Calgary, in Edmonton, and in other major cities. So we need a, a, uh, uh, a dramatic, a, a, a radical new approach uh, and a housing strategy. Now, there goes that phone again. <laughs> You asked a second question about the Marxist-Leninist Party of Canada. Yeah, you see, yeah. Oh, no, hold on a second. Let me answer this question yeah, and then you can go next. Huh? You asked a question about the Marxist-Leninist Party. Um, well, yes, we have relations with the Marxist-Leninist Party in the sense that uh, we have worked together on, on certain campaigns, uh, especially around electoral reform. Um, um, there is a... Um, a uh, group of parties, registered parties, that are not in Parliament, but are official registered parties who meet on a fairly regular basis and fight to create more of a, a, a fairness in terms of um, access to media um, with respect to electoral laws like the Unfair Elections Act that was passed last year by the Tories and so on. And so we work with, uh, with that party and cooperate with that party because we have similar interests. Now politically, however, there are still differences between the two. And uh, um, the Marxist-Leninist party, back in the late 60s, early 70s, when it was founded, uh, was, was a Maoist party, pro-Beijing, you know. During that period of time, uh, they were really quite sectarian. They were resorted to violence, not violence against the government or the police, but violence against other groups, progressive groups, even trade union uh, workers. Um, so they were, in our view, really quite infantile. Yeah? Uh, but they changed. Um, after the collapse or the disappearance of the Soviet Union 
and the, the socialist governments in Eastern Europe and also in Albania, which is where they had come to support the Albanian uh, government of Enver Hoxha. After that, the, the uh, Marxist-Leninist party changed their position quite radically. They stopped calling themselves Marxists and so on. They stopped talking about Marxism. They were going to change their name to the Party of Democratic Renewal uh, and so on. And they stopped talking about class and socialism and so on. Then they changed again, and now they've moved more back towards advocacy of socialism. So this is a party that has gone, um, they've me meandered. You know, people know what the word meandering is. So they have meandered quite a bit. Um, but that's not to say that in the future we, we, we won't be able to work together. It's possible. Uh, and we're, we're not opposed to it in principle. But we think that this party still has some contradictions that, that need to be resolved um, before we could move to any closer cooperation uh, with them. Uh, but uh, like, for instance, if you go to their website, and I'm not suggesting you should go to the website, but if you do go to the Marxist-Leninist website, they have a platform there, too. And uh, what I suggest is you look at their platform and look at our platform, and you will see a marked difference. Their platform is very vague. It doesn't mention the question of socialism. It doesn't mention the, the, even the question of nationalization. They just say no more privatization, which is good and privatization, but they don't call for nationalization. So there are some differences uh, between our two parties. But here's, uh, here's the rub, and I, I'm sure everybody in this room probably, uh, well, if you're in Brampton North, it's pretty straightforward. We hope you will vote for, for Harinder. He's by far and away the best candidate and the best party to, uh, to vote for. But what if you're from another riding where there isn't a communist running? What to do? It's difficult. In the past, we had endorsed critically, but nevertheless, we said to people, well, if there's no communist in your writing, uh, maybe you should think about voting NDP. Hold your nose and vote for the Social Democrats. But you know what? In this election campaign, we can't endorse the NDP. The NDP has even abandoned their Social Democratic positions and move sharply to the right. Um, so we, we, you know, we, we it would be, um, it would be incomprehensible for us to endorse the NDP or the Liberals. But we know that people don't want to waste their votes and we're not urging people to boycott, to say either vote for us or don't vote at all. So we urge you to use your own best judgment. Look at, if you're in that situation, look at the positions of all of the other candidates. And if there is maybe a green candidate who is a left-wing green, maybe you could consider supporting the greens, or maybe an ML candidate, or maybe somebody from some other party. The greens, by the way, Really, you have to look at every writing because there are some Greens who are quite progressive and there are other Greens who are right-wing, almost racist. There was one candidate in Scarborough. This was in the last election, but it's, it's, it's instructive that they had a candidate who got up at a public meeting and said that he was opposed to letting any immigrants into Canada. He wanted to close the door on immigration completely. Why? Because the more people that are here, the more pollution there is. That was a green position. Can you imagine? Can you imagine such a backward position and almost a racist position? So you have to be very careful. And I suggest that if, if, if you have this dilemma that you look very carefully at who the candidates are and the positions of the parties, and try and use your best judgment. That's the best I can say. Yeah. Yes, comrade. You gave the answers of uh, approximately 75% of my questions. Mm -hmm. and so give us the other 25%. <laughs> 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 
because my question was that uh, uh, I want to clear my question also. My question was that uh, there our uh, we don't have our candidate, our communist candidate. So for which candidate we have to support? Okay. You already told us that.